Hey, Scott, was your phone ringing? <laughs> yeah, in 1997. Was your 1997 phone ringing? Yeah, a little loud. <laughs> what does it sound like? Uh, a little like, whoops, not that. <laughs> Yeah, that's like that's like when I was a kid in the '80s. I used to listen to this cassette tape of '50s era commercials. Yeah, that's the same feeling I get when I hear that. Yeah, like if, if there's a certain part of your brain that it it pokes, it yeah. doesn't have to even be your nostalgia. It's weird. No. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a public service reminder, if you're watching this video on the Daily Tech News Show YouTube channel, you're in the right place. If you're watching this video on the Ace Detect YouTube channel, well, we're not going to stop posting them there, but we're not going to get them there as fast as we used to because they auto-post to the Daily Tech News Show channel now at youtube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. So go subscribe over there if you want to get them faster. Uh, would you like to do a show, Scott? Yeah, I would. Also, I'd like YouTube to make it possible to just move videos between accounts. One day they should do that. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. If you own multiple accounts, let me drag. Or even not set off content ID on your own stuff when you uh, have two channels. That one's pretty good. That would be nice, too. I like that. But yes, to answer your question, I have, I'm as prepared as I've ever been. Were you born ready? No. no <laughs> I had to really work at it. <laughs> Here we go. Hey, you know that Tom Merritt? That's one guy that really knows where his towel is. And because he knows where his towel is, I support him on Patreon. If you would like to do the same, head on over to patreon.com slash ace detect. Push the button, Tom. Oops, already pushed it. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, June 24th, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. It is Wednesday. Scott Johnson is here. All is right with the world. We confused the heck out of people, Scott, the last couple days. Veronica is usually in on Mondays, came in on a Tuesday. Patrick Beja is usually on on Tuesdays, wasn't here at all because he's on vacation. Brecky Thomason was on Monday. We don't even know what day he's supposed to be on because he just comes when he wants. He's like a wizard. How are you doing? It must be summer, and I'm glad to be the big oak tree that won't move on Wednesday. I'm just here. I'm solid. I'm not going anywhere, man. I'm here for you. You are. You are the oak tree. You just sway in the wind. Yeah. Um, I was trying to, I was giving myself a minute to see if I could remember who did that song. Oak tree. Oak tree. Is that a song? Not, not coming to me. Oh, Somebody will. All right. I'm sure I'll get a thousand tweets about it. Yeah. room is listening. They know their stuff. My guess is before this episode's over, we'll have an answer. Yeah. And I'll go, all oh, right, that guy. Meanwhile, I write down the headlines so I don't forget them. TechCrunch reports that the Facebook Messenger app is all grown up and has left home. Messenger will now let users sign up even if they don't have a Facebook account and don't want a Facebook account. You won't need to dirty your fingers or your identification with Facebook at all. All you need is a first and last name and a phone number. That's it. You could sign up for Facebook Messenger. Feature rolls out today in the United States, Canada, Peru, and Venezuela with more countries to follow. Pretty interesting idea that they can, we've talked about before how, you know, forcing people to do it has been really weird or forcing them out into another app experience. But the idea that if somebody may come to your app without any Facebook branding to draw them there and still choose your app, it's a very odd idea to me. I guess it just depends on uptake of the of the app and who's using it. Yeah, they really want people to use Messenger as Messenger, the way they would use WeChat or WhatsApp or or, or any of those. Uh, and some people are like, I don't want to have a whole Facebook thing. I just want to chat with my friends. So if your friends aren't on Facebook, now you can still chat with them on Messenger. They don't have to give up anything more than their phone number. And maybe down the road, it'll change their mind and they'll, they'll want to sign up for Facebook. I guess that's Facebook's bet. Well, happy to see this small group being taken care of. VentureBeat reports Microsoft has officially launched its Microsoft uh, Soft Office apps. That would be Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, for those not paying attention for the last 20 years. For phones running Android 4.4 and up, it's a huge move for a company that uh, recently didn't like Android so much. The apps were previously available as previews. The apps can now be used for free, and uh, you can read, preview, and make edits to documents stored in your OneDrive, Google Drive, Box, Dropbox, SharePoint, all the big major players. Uh, certain power user features like track changes or custom color shading require Office 365 subscriptions. But this is a pretty bold, great move, a continuing move by Microsoft to put their services and their software into platforms that make sense. And I'm, I'm excited for Office users. Especially because we're waiting for the new version of Office apps for Windows Phone. And now we've got them for Android phone, tablet, iOS phone, tablet. Uh, and, and the you know, I am not a big fan or I guess I don't require phone versions of these so much uh, but I know people who do 
And this is a this is a big deal if you're on an Android phone and it opens up Office to a lot of people. Uh, it's very minimal what you can't do with these. It really is those those kind of power user features, which would likely require you to get an Office 365 subscription anyway. If you're using the apps at those levels, you'd be using the desktop apps. I'm guessing, and probably want a subscription for those desktop apps to keep them updated. So yeah, uh, this, is, this is a good deal all around. Having a strange effect on me as a person who doesn't necessarily like Office, and I think the reason I don't is I hopped on the bandwagon that just said, ah, Microsoft, you suck, this version's terrible, or whatever, or you, it's too bloated, and Office has been terrible, and not really having a good reason not to like it. They're pulling me, they're pulling me back around with this openness. Yeah. I think that was on purpose, but I'm a little surprised at how quickly I have turned my mental block about Microsoft around. The idea that I'm sitting here uh, while we were, you know, looking at this story earlier today and thinking, you know, maybe I should be editing my Google Docs in Word sometimes, not all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's exactly what Microsoft wants me to be thinking because that just solidifies me as a as an as an Office 365 subscriber. So, mm -hmm. Satya Nadella, you crafty bugger, right. Satya Mania, as Justin <laughs> says, it's running wild. Uh, Morris Day in the Time, Oak Tree. <laughs> I had to look for it myself though. I'm a little. I am uh, impressed, dude. I cannot believe you figured that one out. Nice job. Yeah. Well, uh, meanwhile, uh, Google decided right now that they didn't like me saying that <laughs> about uh, Google Drive. So Daily Tech News Show's lineup logged out, and now it has reloaded. Okay, good. Ars Technica reports on Microsoft MVP Patrick Barker's discovery that some Samsung, PC run, some Samsung PCs run a program called Disable underscore Windows Update. Dot exe that disables Windows Update, like it sounds. Uh, instead, they run Samsung's SW Update Suite, which does keep your Windows up to date, but some people are like, I would rather just get the Microsoft updates directly. Why are you doing this? Samsung customer support rep told Barker that Windows default drivers don't always work well with Samsung devices, like especially she used as an example USB 3.0 ports. So Samsung runs its own software update mechanism to make sure the proper device drivers are applied. Even if a user turns Windows Update back on, if they reboot the computer, it will be turned off again by this, by this uh, executable. How long has that been a thing? And they just discovered it? Or has this been in there the whole time and we just never noticed? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, Samsung is retreating from from the PC world stage, uh, they're still available in, in in several regions, but they they've shut down sales in some regions. So it may just be the popularity of the platform is is not as good. Uh, it may be that Samsung's software update suite works so well that you just never noticed until now. Uh, that's it, it's a good question. Like if nobody noticed till now, was it really a problem? Or it may be that it doesn't happen on every Samsung device. Only a, a very few of them that have USB 3.0 ports in particular. Yeah. Uh, but this isn't the way it should work. The default driver should work. And so Samsung's implementation, in my my guess is Samsung's implementation must be a little wonky here. Yeah. It just it feels reminiscent of people complaining about bloatware on Android phones made by Samsung. And that whole argument it feels like there's a lot of light from that shining on this. And that's perhaps why people are up in arms. But uh, I didn't know they were pulling out of the PC market in such a, a big way. So that'll be interesting. Uh, with six days to spare, so right under the wire. Apple has signed deals that will put thousands of independent artists on Apple Music. Billboard reports that label collective Beggars Group and rights group Merlin are on board after Apple agreed to pay artists for streams during the three-month trial period. Uh, source told Billboard, the optics don't look good if, uh, sorry, if Apple backs down to indie labels, but if they back down to an artist like Taylor Swift, it shows they are sensitive to artist concerns, unlike Spotify, who blew Taylor Swift off when she complained about the free tier. Uh, Apple Music launches on June 30th. This has been all the talk this week. Certainly, Daily Tech News Show has been inundated with talk about it, but it is very interesting to see this happen, and a lot of people want to quickly, I just want to make this clear from my own point of view, a lot of people want to very quickly get on the bandwagon and say, well, look at Apple caving to the demands of of musicians. And I don't know why anyone's saying that. This is a really good sign, and I don't care if it's Apple, Google, or whoever, whoever decides that, you know what, we need to start giving a fair shake to the people creating the content that makes our service even possible, and we made a goof here, let's quickly course correct, and let's do it again with this other thing with more independent artists. Whatever it takes to get to a place where there's a more, you know, equity 
in that market is a really, really good thing. And for the life of me, I can't understand how people are seeing this as take that giant corporate entity, uh, little, you know, getting screwed by the little guy again or whatever. I can't, I cannot deal with that mentality. This is good for music, whether it's Apple or anyone else. I don't care who does it. This hopefully sets a precedence for that. And I think it's a good thing. Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I, I can't disagree with you, although I also think that this is uh, definitely a corporation uh, caving to public pressure at the same time, right? I mean, Apple was touting that they were going to give a higher percentage of their royalties to artists. Taylor Swift came along, posted a blog post saying, yeah, except for the free trial period. After the beggars group in Merlin, by the way, had already written their own open letters about exactly that same thing. But that's why this source from Billboard is so interesting saying, yeah, they couldn't give in to the labels because then the big labels would come back to Apple and say, well, hold on. You know, why did why did you agree to do X, Y and Z if you're going to just cave on this part? Uh, but if you can make it look like you're saying, oh, we're doing it for the artists because an artist complained, then suddenly uh, it's worth the PR risk and you, you can have a story to take back to the labels. But make no mistake, uh, this is not about any particular corporate enterprise coming to, you know, uh, coming to the realization that they need to be nicer to people. This is, this is all public pressure and, and strategic moves. Yeah, if we let them just do it, they do it, of course. Yeah. But to be somewhat flexible is a good sign. In the face of the pressure, to be flexible in that wind is an important feature moving forward. And I'm glad they did it. I hope everyone else does it. I hope Spotify and RDO and everybody else kind of goes along with, with this because I, I don't know about you, Tom, but in 10 years, I don't want to be in a world where musicians uh, are the poorest people on the planet and nobody makes any good music anymore. And we're, we're left with, you know, you know big artists. I yeah. don't think that's like ever going to be a risk. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's, you're, you're actually spouting the label line there, which is like, well, you need to have harder copyright law or we'll, won't, we'll have a world without music. And I don't think you mean it that way, but that is, that is, look, uh, we will have music. We could have no payments and we would have music and we would have good music. Uh, the question is how do we best go about, uh, rewarding people for that? And how do we best go about, uh, motivating people to continue to make uh, good music. That's what the conversation should be. Fair point. The next web reports that Chinese smartphone maker Meizu will release the Ubuntu edition MX4 phone in Europe tomorrow. Price is 299 euros and includes 5.36 inch, 1152 by 920 pixels, 1920 pixels. Uh, gorilla gra glass, <laughs> Gorilla grass. It'd be really hard to see through that. Gorilla glass three equipped display, 16 gigs of internal storage, a 20.7 megapixel main camera, two megapixel camera in front, and comes with silver or gold detailing. The MX4 will be offered you using an invite system to try to build some anticipation. You have to go to an origami wall on Meizu's website, M-E-I-Z-U. No word on release outside of Europe right now. But uh, this is the best Ubuntu phone that's been released yet. So Ubuntu phone fans, get to your origami wall. Hey, Tom, you got to get some of this gorilla grass, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's so strong. Uh, PCMag.com reports that Lenovo, doing one of my favorite things that I've heard about this week, unveiled its first PC on a stick. Love this idea. The And I'm not going to say this right. The Idencenter? How do you say Idea that? Center. Idea Center. It's not like one big word, though. It's weird. Yeah. Anyway, the Idea Center Stick 3000. Uh, this is what it's called. The device works with most HDMI-compatible monitors and televisions, which is an interesting twist on the TV. The $129 mini PC port uh, or uh, PC sports a 1.3 gigahertz Intel Atom processor. By the way, the same Atom processor used in the Intel offering. Uh, 2 gig of RAM, 32 gig of storage, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 4.0 connectivity. It's got one micro USB 2.0 slot, SD card reader, and ships with Windows 8.1 upgradable to 10 on the 29th, so we'll handle that. Uh, you will need to bring your own 2.4 gigahertz wireless keyboard and mouse, however, to the party. But this thing is, uh, I'd say, if you laid maybe two USB sticks next to each other, that's about the width, and it's a little thicker than a standard USB stick. Uh, I am always infinitely fascinated with the idea of how small we can get computing into tiny little boxes and this seems like a really cool thing, but then I started to think about application, and all I could think of was, well, you could do a presentation in front of a bunch of people on a TV, uh, you could bring up some documents in front of a board meeting, but with 32 gigs of storage and uh, two gig of RAM, I'm not sure what else you could do, but it's pretty cool.
Did I lose Tom? He froze. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we may have lost him on the video for a second, but he'll come back. Uh, he's still doing the audio show somewhere. Oh, is he? Okay. I've that... learned this. I've learned this lesson now, which is that we are now we have now diverged to an alternate universe where Tom is still talking, <laughs> still doing the show. The face he was giving me too when I finished. <laughs> it's so amazing. Yeah, it looked oh, like. I gotta, I gotta take a screen grab of it. Yeah, it's gonna be uh... great. Um, bup, bup. So if you're watching the video, you may have to go listen to the audio today to get a better show out of it. He'll come back. Yeah. So um, we're still on video then right now. Yeah, we're still on video. And uh, I'm, I think he probably knows, but I'm just going to write know. him in Slack. He's still by now, yeah. yeah. Oh, he's know. coming back. Well, that's the uh, problem when you go with a fly-by-night service like Google. <laughs> right. You, you, but you lived. You survived. You're back. Yeah. Okay. You're you're giving me uh giving me some crazy weird stuff on your audio though. Maybe that'll clear itself up. Say something else. You're pretty crusty at first when you came back, but it should be evening out a little better now. Your picture oh. looks good. Yeah. Both. Uh, everyone else sounds good. Jenny and uh, Roger both sounded fine while you were gone. So Can you? Know. It sounds like you need to unplug and plug in your headset, which I know your system doesn't work that way though. So yeah. um, not sure what the deal is. Try. Let's see. Let me try something here. You're just all fuzzy. I just muted everything. Is it any better? No. Same? Hmm. Uh, Roger, say something. Uh, Roger may have gone. Hello. I'm just all, yeah, you're all fuzzy to me. Maybe it's me then. Hold okay. on. I'm going right. I'm I'm to rejoin. Maybe we should all shave. Scott, I, I have to say, I'm pretty much going to blame that no gear ringtone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, so you did it again, and we lost Tom again. It happened again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So I don't remember yeah, my hundred percent of it. There we go. Now it's fine. Was it fine now? All right. It was just a weird. It was just a weird connection on my end, and it would have only affected the uh, the sound recording and the uh, Alpha Geek Radio folks because everybody on watching on the Hangout was fine. Oh, good. It's probably the Gorilla Grass. You're right. <laughs> I shouldn't have talked about the. Pot. You shouldn't have, man. They just came down on you. All right. Uh, you will need to bring your own 2.4 gigahertz wireless mouse. Uh, you were about to say... And I last talked thing about I heard you say... Yeah, what did you hear? For the, for the audio version, I, I'd pick up from where you're like, it's 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 the size of two USB sticks laid side by side. Yeah. And then I'll pick up after that? Yeah. All right. Uh, and if you stu if you have basically one and a half sticks tall, that's how tall this thing is. It has all the ports you need. I don't think... Uh, people are going to use it for much more than a presentation or, hey, here's some cool documents for the board meeting or something like that. Like, I, it's it's not enough storage and not enough RAM capacity or CPU power to do much else. Uh, so I don't know what the real killer app here is, but I just know they're really cool. And for 129 I kind of tempted to get one. It, it's kind of a weird new form factor that's all the rage. Uh, and, and I think Google kicked it off with the Chromecast. And folks like Lenovo and Intel were like, well, we can give you a whole computer in there. We don't have to limit you. Because the Chromecast is essentially a computer. They're just limiting what it can do. Its operating system is minimal, right? So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I'm not sure what these are going to end up being best for. But I love the idea that they're out there. They're affordable. And people can try all kinds of things from home media centers to, to presentation displays to whatever. Right? I, suspect, I suspect some really cool hackery that will happen. Somebody's going to come up with some amazing... Uh, hacks to this thing that will make it a must buy. Um, not, not unlike the way people use Raspberry Pis and other, you know, small platforms now to do interesting things. So that's actually more interesting to me, but at a price of 129, that's hardly anything to sneeze at. And I think it would be fun just to have around, like you got to have a quick way to hook up a TV, show a bunch of people, some kind of cool slideshow. You're and it's, you know, yeah, it's, and well, and it's you know it's going to end up actually being mostly bought by enterprise level customers who think, oh, well, this is a very cheap way to roll out uh, desktops instead yeah, of having. Yeah. To, yeah. And their employees. I can see my receptionist at the eye at the eye doctor having one of these. <laughs> totally, and she, and everyone will be able to see it really well because you're at the eye doctor. <laughs> Australian broadband users take note. The Sydney Morning Herald reports ISP Xtel has terminated the accounts of about 400 customers, it says used data, quote, in excess of old plan requirements. About a quarter of those who were understood to be on unlimited plans got the boot anyway. They were using too much of their unlimited. 
Extel spokesman uh, Ben Coleman confirmed that it was in response to the growing use of online video streaming like Netflix, Stan, and Presto. The remaining Extel customers have been forced onto new plans, some of which people are complaining cost more but add more restrictions on data usage than the old plans had. Do you find that Australian listeners and fans complain to you more about us when we complain about bad internet or plans that suck? Because I get this all the time. If I even bring up on the morning show that Comcast did a thing, they're all angry with me that, that I'm even complaining at all with a unlimited, relatively secure, great plan, and they're all getting garbage plans. And I didn't know if that was just me or if I was just hearing from one or two guys in Australia, but this leads me to believe that it's, it's a problem down there, man. Yeah, it is a problem down there. There is no doubt about it. Uh, Peter Wells, Raj you are on the show quite often from Australia, uh, and they back it up. In fact, Peter Wells is usually the source of these kinds of stories. He'll, he'll drop them in our Slack uh, chat overnight so we know what's going on uh, about them. So I thank him for that. And uh, maybe the solution is to bring these stories up on the morning stream from time to time as a, as a peace offering. Like, hey, you guys, you know, when I complain about Comcast, I, na- I know you, you've got those feels. Yeah. You've got those problems because, and all your video games cost ninety dollars. I don't know what you guys oh, do. Oh man, right? Photoshop is like two thousand four hundred dollars. I don't understand what's happening. Uh, Tech Dirt reports ICANN is considering a proposal limit or two limit rather. Uh, who can use a proxy to protect their private information when registering a domain name? Mark Monitor, a company which uh, specializes in takedown notices, leads a group proposing that ICANN not allow domain holders associated with commercial activity, quote unquote to hide their registration information like addresses, phone number, and email. Registrar Name Cheap has a site called respectourprivacy.com arguing against the, pro- the proposal. I don't, I don't know where I land on this. I don't well, essentially what's happening is Mark Monitor says, we have a hard time uh, fighting the pirates if they can hide their address from us when we want to send our threatening legal notices. So you should make it so that they can't do that, I can. Uh, and, you know, Namecheap and the EFF and a, a bunch of other organizations are like, that's a horrible idea. We, we have a hard enough time protecting your privacy. And if you don't put either a fake email or, or, or put your email behind a proxy on your domain name registration, you are just basically saying, please send me spam at that point. And, uh, and so that's the two sides of this argument. This argument. Well, time will tell. Go, go. I can do as little as you can, though, because one day someone's going to get ticked and then you're going to be gone. And Yeah. Uh, I spent way too much time uh, right before the show digging into Akamai's Q1 2015 State of the Internet report, which just came out like within the last hour. Worldwide, average speed rose 10% over Q4 2014 uh, and 30% year over year. So the Internet's getting faster all around the globe. South Korea still has the top highest average connection speed with a 6.3% increase. They're up to 23.6 megabits per second, while Singapore passed up Hong Kong for the highest peak connection speed. That means the the point at which the average is the highest rather than the average over the the entire usage period. Uh, Their peak was 98.5 megabits per second, so almost a gigabit uh, on average there. Bulgaria remains the country with the highest level of Internet adoption at 97%. On the mobile side, speeds ranged from a high of 20.4 megabits per second on average in the U.K., who have the fastest mobile speed to a low of 1.3 megabits per second in Vietnam. And Australia had the top peak mobile speed at 149.3 megabits per second. The uh, total volume of mobile data traffic grew by 12% over Q4 2014. So we're getting, as we know, a lot more people using mobile. Well, it's too bad the U.S. isn't a little higher on those lists. I guess Delaware. What's, Delaware's got 18.6 megabits per average. Or uh, averages. Let's uh, see. U.S. I don't quite. Yeah, get the, the Del- Delaware's average connection speed is 18.6 megabits per second. I threw those notes in there because the argument is always, well, of course, South Korea is a, a smaller country, so it's easier for them to get 23.6 megabits per second. And you know, for for comparison, if you're having that argument, uh, our top Average speed per state is the small state of Delaware, and they can only get 18.6. So even if you reduce the sample size in the United States, uh, the fastest example is still not as fast as South Korea. Uh, and overall, the U.S. is 19th uh, out of everyone, which is still high on the list. There's 100 countries or more, uh, but 11.9 megabits per second on average, right behind Belgium. Yeah, Belgium of all places. Great. We like them. Jean-Claude and all that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Time now for some news from you. Uh, in fact, you've been hearing some news from you. We we got news from you all over this this thing, but we always highlight a couple of them. And I take that as a chance to encourage you to go vote on stories. DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com. Help us out. Let us know what you're interested in. Like JMB Berg 26 did when he noted that Windows Central has a post that Microsoft may ship hard copies of Windows 10 after all on USB sticks. WinFuture.de says they have a source telling them home and pro versions of Windows 10 will be sold in retail stores on USB instead of DVD. Kind of makes sense. Windows 10 Home is listed at 120 bucks, and Windows 10 Pro at 200 bucks. So pricey USB sticks, uh, although existing Windows 7 and 8 users can get a free upgrade at launch on July 29th. So this would only be if you're buying a new copy for a new PC. Uh, let's see, is that th- that's a Thursday that week, or is that a Wednesday? That's a Good Thursday. Question. Uh, because that's Nerdtacular Weekend, and I'm just curious how many of us will enter that event with possible PCs running Windows 10 at that point. Like full so Windows. So I will have to hurry up and upgrade that morning before I fly out, is there what you're go. saying. That's the trick, Tom. Be there, because you're the tech guy. you got to tell us how that all went. Okay, so now, okay, so this the little private insight. I have been wanting to buy either a Lenovo or a Dell, uh, and I had this conversation with Darren Kitchen on the post show last week, uh, to run Linux. I want to run Linux Arch on it. I haven't tried Arch yet. But the Lenovo only comes with Windows. At least I can only find it with Windows. I know they sell it with Linux installed, but I couldn't find a way to do that easily. Uh, so I was thinking of buying it and then reinstalling. But what if I bought it, held on to it, did the Windows upgrade at Nerdtacular? Oh, I like this. We could do it on stage. Yeah. That'd be during, weird. During like the TMS panel or something. Why not? It's about tech. Man, we'll figure yeah. something out. It's a cool idea. Ooh, live Windows upgrade. I mean, it's not that exciting, but it'd be kind of a fun thing. <laughs> not really, but cool. Yeah. Uh, Captain Kipper, who's always sending stuff everywhere. This guy contributes to some of my shows as well. Sent us uh, this Ars Technica art- article reporting that the EFF and others are requesting an exemption in the U.S. Digital Millennium Copyright Act to allow users to revive abandoned online games. It's very interesting. Uh, however, Entertainment Software Association President Mike Gallagher criticized copy, uh, copyright arguments that rely on games or servers being considered abandoned or obsolete, arguing that games are often reutilized and repurposed on different devices and platforms. The uh, Copyright Office is also considering a, DCM, or a DMCA exemption that would allow users to legally jailbreak video game consoles in the same manner as cell phones to allow for new functionality and play homebrew software. Similar petition was denied in 2012. Uh, so, I have a couple things to say about this real quick. The idea that old games are abandoned, let's just say, we'll take an example, uh, NBA uh, Live 20 or 2009, if that even existed. But those games come, they have a lot of server functionality, a lot of online play, uh, storage of local scores, or your scores are stored, uh, you know, stored on the server, and everybody's scores are compared all the time, and all this stuff, and you can play each other. When they decide to shut those servers down, those games, in a lot of cases, not all, but they become kind of useless. You just don't have them, you know, one of their huge portions, if not all their functionality, is removed. A better example would be the Matrix Online, a massively multiplayer online RPG that was shut down, and you cannot play the Matrix Online unless you go hack together some sort of homebrew server and run, you know, some stolen software and make it run and then invite your friends. Uh, They are essentially dead. I mean, what what, I think what people are asking for is, look, if the game's not going to be made anymore and the Matrix Online is officially gone, and I can't pay you to let me play it anymore, but I really want to play it, why not let these things become public in some way? Whether or not that has restriction on, uh, restrictions that say you can't augment it too much or change the code too much, whatever the, the reasonable solution is, I don't see any reason why you should keep that stuff locked away. It's not doing anybody any good, and there's not like there's some weird proprietary stuff there other than licensing. That that's going to get out there. Maybe that's the whole thing is licensing. Maybe you know Warner Brothers doesn't want to let go of that. I don't know. Well, yeah, there's the idea of overbroad protection because you never know when Lost Vikings is going to be popular again, and you'll want to pull it out of nowhere and start using it as a Heroes of the Storm character, right? Uh, so these companies say, well, we yeah, okay, maybe we don't have uh, we're, maybe we're not using a game property right now, but that doesn't mean we won't in the future. We want to protect that. I think there should be a middle ground, though. This is one of the reasons why people argue that copyright protection terms should be shorter uh, because it, that would make these questions moot in a lot of cases. But because it's 90 years plus the life of the author, 
so pretty much forever right now, uh, it means that when you do have a fair use case, it's really hard to carve it out. And there are some legitimate re places where people are like, look, we're not going to be hurting anybody if we use this abandoned game and the percentage chance that it's turned into something profitable for the company that owns the license to it right now in the future uh, is, is very close to zero. On top of that, there's plenty of games like you mentioned, Scott, that j nobody even has the rights to them anymore, but the rights aren't public domain. So you're like, well, I don't know who owns the rights, but somebody does, so you're not allowed to use them. Yeah, and this, the same thing kind of goes for this jailbreaking consoles thing. I, I understand in theory that it wouldn't be that different than a phone, but for some reason it kind of is. Um, it's a platform with a much larger capacity for piracy than it is otherwise with a small device or a phone. That may change over time, but right now that's true. So if you, if you want to jailbreak a, a, a PlayStation 4 or an Xbox One, the, your potential capability for broad piracy infractions broadens substantially. And so I kind of get why that stuff gets denied, but I'm also a big fan of let me buy a thing and let that be the thing I own and do to it what I want to legally. So yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's a, this stuff's interesting. But at the very least, uh, this is not the end of it. I think that this, as we go more digital on everything, this stuff's going to get more and more um, talked about in the next few years. And I suspect we'll finally have some resolution, at least to the idea that, what, you know, what does copyright mean for games and how long can something languish in obscurity before somebody can do something with it? Fifteen um, years into the millennium now, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, not aging well. That's all I'll say. Nope. And that's a look at the headlines. All right, now some of you may be saying, Tom, you mentioned that you look at the Daily Tech News Show Reddit and you take a cue from that. And if you were paying attention, Tom, you would have known that the top story earlier this morning was the hoverboard. Well, we saved it for the main discussion. Lexus posted a teaser of an actual hoverboard. Uh, they have a quote in there from their uh, chief engineer, Haruhiko Tanahasi, talking about doing impossible things. It's beautiful bamboo surface. That iconic Lexus grill uh, uses magnetic levitation and liquid nitrogen cooled superconductors and permanent magnets. It's been in research for 18 months in Germany and London undergoing testing right now with a pro skateboarder in Barcelona and they promise video of that in action because we didn't get to see it in action in the teaser today but video of that test in action coming soon now. Scott Johnson we covered the Hendo hoverboard at the end of last year which would, was not working with liquid nitrogen as far as we know, although they wouldn't really tell us what it was working with, but we didn't see any steam coming out of it like we saw with the Lexus one. Uh, and both of them, the Hendo and the Lexus one, do require a metallic base. You can't just take them anywhere you want. I'm back. Uh, sorry. So what do you think, uh, or, or are you back? Maybe you're not back. We're having a little problem today, uh, folks, with the old... Uh, Hoverboards the old don't go on water, and apparently neither does Scott. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, so, so Scott, are, Scott looks like he's there. But All he's I see is the picture. Okay. Uh, Jenny, uh, Roger, since you guys are, are still hanging around, we'll, we'll try to... And, and Scott, you just speak up if you're actually there. And as soon as we hear you, we'll, we'll acknowledge that. Uh, is this is this all hype? Because because really here's the thing, uh, we we saw a hoverboard in December made by some folks who, who are pretty cool, uh, admittedly saying you know what you're not going to be able to do this off a metal track, but we're going to do a Kickstarter and we're going to put this kind of technology in the hands of people. And they've been a little delayed with their test boxes, but they promise it's coming. Now Lexus comes out with a teaser trailer that doesn't show you anything except something that's smoking, hovering over what appears to be concrete, but later Lexus said was actually metal. Uh, and you, you can do this in a science experiment. Uh, the Royal Institution showed a science experiment where you super cool a superconductor and put it over a magnetic track, and it can hover and fly around. So is this just a big trick? I don't think it's a big trick, but I don't. I see it more of a, a, as a PR and perhaps a R&D kind of push because I mean realistically I mean a, as a consumer product you maybe get a few people to buy them because I mean just thinking about the cost alone as well as the resources you would need if you're using superconducting magnets you would need something to cool them down to that temperature and you would probably need a giant vat of liquid nitrogen or some other material um, but it's it's interesting like we're the only thing that that levitates that does okay are maglev trains 
uh, the ones they have in China, and I think, I'm not sure they have them in Germany, even though they're designed and built in Germany, where they essentially do away, well, they have wheels, but they do away with wheels when they run, and essentially magnets pull the train up off the track. The idea is that you get less resistance, and therefore you can re attain higher speeds uh, and a, a potentially higher energy savings, even though you would draw a lot of power just to lift the train up. Well, that so was, it's, that it's, was my it's, question. It's, can, you, can you clarify that a little bit? Because my question was about this entire technology. I, you, I watched a bunch of videos before today's episode. I wanted to get clear on what had been done up to this point, kind of what the ideas behind the tech were. Tom shared this great video showing this kind of rad, small-scale example of how this sort of thing would work on a big uh, Mobius uh, ring, which is pretty neat, Mobius strip, rather. Um, but when, it's, when we talk about high-speed trains in Asia and other places, are they, I mean, I've always assumed there were, like, magnets involved and that there was no resistance only, at all. Only in the maglev trains. The majority of the high-speed trains still run on wheels, but they run on special track that have to be high, of high precision because when you're rolling doing close to, I guess, the new Shinkansens do over 200 miles an hour. Um, they're, they're running on special wheels and running on special track. And that's part of the cost, is that all that stuff costs money. So it's one reason why the whole California high-speed rail uh, debacle is mired in so much controversy and money, is because it costs a lot of money to make something go very, very fast. All right, but let's, uh, let's, let's pull yeah, back from getting in. I, it would, yeah, it would, the get into talking about the train industry. But I want to pull us back towards hoverboards uh, and, and talk about that because there's less of a cost issue in, as far as like rollout and, and, and yeah. industrial and more of a usage issue, which is the Hendo hoverboard, you could steer. They showed how you could actually yeah. steer. Uh, this Lexus hoverboard looks more like it's it's just a super cool superconductor, which I don't know if they've come up with nifty ways to steer. They haven't said that yet, but it's not obvious that they have. So then you have to be on a metal surface, not necessarily yeah. a track, but you have to be on a metal surface, and you have to have put in some kind of steering. Uh, and I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure just how usable this actually is, or if it's just for kicks, which may be fine. You feel like proof of concept yeah. is what's happening here. They just want to show that look, it actually really truly functions. That a guy can safely go the length of a football field without wiping out or dying, and and maybe this could lead to. Uh, innovations with car technology and other transportation technology that it isn't just limited uh, you know to, to a small personal device like that that to me seems like what they're doing because the ultimate goal would be hey every freeway has asphalt in it yeah. we've figured out a way for that to repel the smooth surface of the thing and now we're all driving on you know hover mean, cars. if you're talking usage scenario I I have a very hard time believing that it would be used in any kind of mass-produced consumer product. However, I do see it being a replacement for traditional coaster-style rides at amusement parks, where an individual, instead of being strapped into essentially what is a rail, a rail and 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 a wheel vehicle, you could say like, oh, it'd be like a slip and slide, where you just kind of do a luge or what's the other one, skeleton, where you just kind of lay on it and then you can kind of guide it. And the great thing is, of course, you're floating, right? And so a lot of the dynamics that you would get if you're on a wheeled vehicle would suddenly not be there anymore. And you could get kind of the sensation of gliding over it. But because you need a special track to do it, I don't, I don't see it being used as a mass transit or a, a personal transportation device well, my favorite, anytime soon. My favorite when, about this, oh, go ahead, Jenny. I was just going to say, when can we use it as a skateboard? This is all I want to know. Well, that, right I was going to say the book. same thing, which is like, well, then you could just make a skate park when yeah, you rent these totally. things. So it's kind of like bumper cars. Yeah, totally. It, it's practical. The Hendo one seems a lot farther along and a lot more practical to me, though. It seems like they're just using copper surface. Uh, the, which which doesn't require any any liquid nitrogen. Uh, that seems easier to produce. And they had an accelerometer gyroscope control system that they talked about, where it would read your pressure inputs, and then it would actually move the hoverboard, not you, but it would be as if you were moving it because it would respond to your tilts and and the way you move your foot. That that seemed a lot better. And they're having problems. They're having delays. I'm a little suspicious of this Lexus thing because, hey, it gets back to the future two year, and in October they want to like get a bunch of people yeah. looking at their videos and thinking about Lexi or whatever the plural of Lexus is. Lexus is. Yeah. Uh, so I, this just does seem to me like that Royal Institution video that Scott was talking about 
writ large, which is a bit of an achievement, right? If you can support a human standing on it and maybe even provide some control, I guess that is kind of cool. Um, but I, I see the Hendo one actually turning into something that you could go to a skate park like Jenny's talking about. I'm not sure that the Lexus one is anything more than a gimmick. Well, if this is true that they've been in research for 18 months, they've been working on it in Germany and London, and a pro skateboarder, they don't give a name, but a pro skateboarder is currently testing it in Barcelona, a video of which is supposed to surface soon. I think that could say a lot, and it may, it may lean entirely toward it being a recreational type device and not a, a stab at changing the way we transport you know, we transport. Yeah. I, I definitely see it as kind of a uh, leisure activity, like something that you would go to a park or perhaps like, you know, uh, a warehouse that's set up for this and you pay like, yeah, here's my here's my $10 entry fee. You you know, they give you a rental board that they take care of. Uh, you know, you, you get your few, you know, you get your, you know, 10 minute lesson and you go out and try and see if you can do a, do a morning McFly. It'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also the the thing about the the Hendo is that it, it's it's a relatively low ride height. I mean, it's like what is it a uh, an inch? Yeah, inch off. Like so you know that that could be interesting too because like if you were to do a jump off it, would you auger the the bottom of the board into the um, into the surface? You know, on a skateboard when you when you when you do something like an ollie or, or a ramp, you come back down on the wheel. The wheel still will turn even mm -hmm. if you land on it really hard. So I'm wondering what, what you can and cannot do. How much bounce. Yeah. yeah. yeah because yeah. you only get a niche. Uh, BioCal points out that uh, hover pallet movers in a warehouse could be a, a use for this. Also, the Hendo needs thick copper. It's not, I said a sheet yeah. of copper, but that kind of applies a thin sheet. It's a thick, very thick yeah. sheet of copper there. Uh, and Lau Roman says it's probably easier to have liquid nitrogen as opposed to copper. Those aren't either ores. The liquid nitrogen system that Lexus is showing would still need a metal uh, surface to yeah. to work over, but maybe it's a cheaper metal. I don't know. Copper's not not cheap. I, yeah, I don't think you could do a warehouse. I I see I see flotation pads based on like blown air, like a hovercraft, uh, being more practical for a warehouse situation than magnetics. Well, when it gets all when it gets practical for every situation is when we don't need to worry about the metal floor. And I don't yeah. know when that is or what that is or how the technology ever evolves to, say, accommodate uh, cement and asphalt and everything else that we already have sort of down. But when that happens, all bets are off and the world changes. Until that, it's a little specialized because you got to change the surface of everything. Now, I'm glad we, uh, we, we dragged Jenny in here because I was going to drag her in here anyway for the pick of the day uh, from Al, who decided to watch the Bethesda announcement and then wanted to order Fallout 4, and then it was sold out. Uh, but then found a website called nowinstock.net, signed up for a free account. They notify you by text, email, or both when your item you're looking for becomes available. They have a large selection of items you can get notifications for, like game systems, video cards, frozen merchandise, I guess cameras. I, I assume he means the Disney series, not just like peas. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. That's what no, those are hot, hot tickets yeah. for kids there. Right, right. Yeah, that makes more sense. Uh, so <laughs> Al signed up, got a text alert around 8.30 last Friday night while grocery shopping, probably for frozen peas, and was able to pre-order his copy from Amazon. He's now very happy, and his wife thinks he's crazy, but wanted to share because he's noticed this becoming a big issue, people buying up stuff early and then selling it on eBay, and those of us who are not quick enough get screwed. Uh, Al says, I know it's capitalism, but it still sucks. Mm. Uh, so anyway, this is not an advertisement. These picks are just from you. And Al said, uh, I, I really wanted people to know about Now in Stock, uh, nowinstock.net. Now, Jenny, I know you were able to get in on the Fallout uh, order. Did you use something like this? So I saw nowinstock.net in our email, and I went and checked it out. And I tried to order it from Walmart, but it went to a blank page, so I feel like maybe Walmart didn't have it as much in stock or it had just stolen out or something. But I had earlier, right when I heard the, the announcement, signed up for the Amazon alert, and it came to my email, and I clicked through, and I pre-ordered, and I am so... Look at me. I'm already wearing wrist guards in preparation for my Pip-Boy. Is it November yet, and when will it be November? You want to hear my prediction? Here's my prediction, Jenny. You're going to get yes. that thing. You're going to wear it once, put the phone in it, show everybody, laugh for about five seconds, and then you're going to never If it's it. comfortable, if it's actually even vaguely ergonomic, I'm going to wear it forever. No. You, just, you just made sure that Jenny will wear this for as long as possible. <laughs> what you're going to do is you're going to take it, you're going to put it away, and then you're going to wear it for either Halloween or some sort of uh, convention cosplay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Send middle. your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com and you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. In fact, we put a lot of your picks there as well. I uh, got a couple of emails about undo send. Uh, Rich from lovely Cleveland thinks uh, that one of the benefits of using a desktop email client is that you can control when you send and receive your email. I have Outlook set to only send and receive at the top of the hour, he says, which basically gives me a nice big window for undoing any misconceived missives. He says DTNS has benefited from this numerous times. I like all of his emails, but maybe that's why. As a side benefit, it helps my productivity in that my inbox isn't constantly drawing my attention away from the task at hand. I'm sure there's some mobile client that could do the same for your phone. Luckily, I don't have to deal with that for work. Obviously, it's not as convenient as a webmail client, and using Gmail undo send has saved me from a couple of typos, but I actually like the control of a good old desktop client. And then Jason wrote in and said, I'm excited about undo send. I often send an email by mistake using the email shortcut command enter and it's super frustrating when this happens. Having the ability to quickly stop the email from actually being sent is amazing. I'm disappointed to see that the feature has not been included in the inbox by Google. But it is in inbox by Google. It I is. Think. I have inbox yeah. by Google and right. I, I was able now, to do right? it. It's under settings. It wasn't at launch. You had to... You, I don't think it existed at launch. It may have come later in a patch but uh, he's right that it wasn't always there but it okay. is there now. It's very... Oh, look, it's there now, Jason. Yeah. Scott from Blazing Hot, Maryland, who is also a co-executive producer, wanted to provide a follow-up on the story that Veronica got a chuckle out on Tuesday's episode about the Navy paying a boatload of money, he says, bad pun intended, to keep XP updated. Scott says, I work with a lot of government agencies that have a very legitimate reason to stay on XP. One example is a very large-scale security system with the primary application being a 16-bit piece of software that depends on IPX, which was deprecated in Windows 7. We tried moving it to Windows 7 and nothing worked, so we went back. Another example is a highly specialized system for secure HF radio messaging that goes even farther back and runs on MS-DOS. Yes, I am responsible to keep a few dozen machines running Windows 3.1 up and running, and it makes me giggle every time they call me with an issue. In both cases, the software makers have gone out of business, and since neither system shows any sign of breaking, there's no motivation to spend taxpayer dollars on a more modern alternative. Well, that's the real, t that's the tear, isn't it? Like, we don't want to spend extra tax money uh, on anything, but then these kinds of things, which you don't think of because they're so invisible to us, they they go old real quick, and before you know it, you're like, man, we're running this on DOS. This can't possibly be the best, way, most secure way to do anything, and we're unwilling to spend money on that. I don't know. I, th I think part of the, the issue, especially when you talk about governments and especially the military, is a lot of this stuff is layered. In other words, there's a lot of processes that run on top of it, and if it means that you change that, then you got to change everything else that relies on it. So it's not just directly that software even updating those machines. It's everything else. That's the, you know, it's the protocols, it's, you know, the, the whole thing that, you know, you, you need, whether it's for sending, you know, secret messages or anything like that, you, you have all these, you know, you have all these procedures and things that you need to follow that have to be rewritten, and then they need to be reevaluated and then revalidated and tested again. And if you already spent money doing all that, I'm not sure if you want to go through and redoing it. It reminds me of the whole thing when the when NASA was looking for 8086 PCs uh, right. on eBay because they needed to replace some of the uh, the, the shuttle uh, uh, PCs aboard the shuttle or the the CPUs aboard the and shuttle. It's cheaper to just find uh, 8086s, even if they had to pay extra yeah. for them because they're rare, than it would be to revalidate, retest, and get up to safety speed on the older stuff. So yeah, you may, a, even with the amount they're paying for XP support, they may be saving money. Yeah, plus you got to imagine there's some voices in government saying, well, move it all to the web. What are you doing? That's quit being so slow and, and back in time. Just put it on unprotected servers like put it on the, the office of OMP did. Yeah, and that gets yeah. bad real quick. So I kind of get where they're at, but it is funny to be, it must be funny to be that guy that gets called to say, yeah, this 3-1 machine, uh, the file. Having a problem with program manager. <laughs> that is that is some good job security. Yeah, yeah right? Yeah. Uh, and finally, Joe the pilot uh, wrote in a very comprehensive view of what happens with flight plan systems, uh, responding to what Veronica and I were talking about yesterday regarding the Polish airline. And uh, it was way too long for me to read on the show, but it was so good that I, I put it up on the blog at dailytechnewsshow.com. So I guess we now have a guest post for the first time. Uh, so Joe the pilot 
wrote it. Check it out, dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, he said the, the TLDR version is just make sure your audience knows there's no way in hell a plane is in danger from a DDoS attack on a flight planning software system. He says, these are his words, and he is a pilot, pilots are dumb, but not that kind of dumb. I'd say we're almost bulletproof from that kind of attack in every way. However, I do apologize in advance for delays to the operation while the hackers hack. Yeah, there you go. It's really well written. I, I saw the post after you It was posted. great. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, thank you, Joe, uh, for, for writing that in and for letting us post it uh, on, on the blog. I uh, hope people enjoy that. And uh, shoot, we got, we got like four times the cast suddenly, <laughs> uh, thanks to a little internet uh, glitches. Thank you, Jenny Josephson, for jumping in and saving the day. Hey! My Go friend. to tellitanyway.com, folks, if you want to hear more of Jenny's brilliance. Uh, and her hosting abilities and storytelling abilities and amazing friends who have great stories. Um, everyone who's on this show now is going to be on that show at some point. You've been warned. Oh, yay. I've been on. <laughs> I think Tom's everyone. already admission achieved. All right. so. I admitted uh, when I was a villain. So if you want to find out what that was, go check out tellinganyway.com. Uh, Roger Chang, thank you for jumping in uh, with the insights, man. That was awesome. Sure. And uh, you can follow him on the Twitter, twitter.com slash Jolly Roger. Yes. I'm not the bar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the three bars that somehow have that are called the Jolly Roger bar or something. But he does offer specials. Just yes. Uh, Special uh, Scott, advice. Scott Johnson is available all over the internet, twitter.com slash Scott Johnson. Of course, frogpants.com. Uh, Brian Ibbett uh, on assignment in Japan right now, right? Yeah. He and I are speaking in about an hour from now about his travails there and things he's seen, stuff he can't unsee, and uh, we're going to record a little special episode for TMS listeners, so they'll want to want to watch for that. And uh, thanks, Google. Interesting internet today. I yeah. Mean, being tested by you. We live in interesting times. Uh, thanks to our 5,087 patrons, though. You guys uh, make it possible for us to continue to do this show. Uh, it's the value for value model, and uh, I stick to that. If you don't get any value out of the show, don't give us anything to keep doing it. That would be that would be encouraging bad behavior. But if you do enjoy the show and you get some value out of it and you can afford to do so, we do ask, uh, you know, give five cents a show at the very least. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support. Our email address is feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. You can give us a call 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. Listen to the show live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern at player.alphageekradio.com and visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. We'll be back tomorrow with Ayaz Akhtar alongside Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> this show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Excellent. I did it in backwards order. It's all right. It screwed me up. Day was weird. I got editing to do. What? I, I don't do editing. It's the whole reason I created this like mouse trap like system. This Rube Goldberg system that I use is merely to prevent me from having to do editing. I do that in the same thing on the morning show. Whenever there's a glitch like that, I freaking hate it. <laughs> Let me ask you, do you want me to fix the video? Uh hmm. Sure. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm saying I don't. Uh, yeah, I love that idea of fixing the video, uh, but I don't know how that works on the YouTube side. I guess we leave the one that's going to be up there automatically until you fixed it, and then take that one down and replace it. Because you can't uh, upload, you can't replace one directly. You'd have to delete one. Yeah, I would have. I, yeah, it, the only issue is it wouldn't show up. And actually, no, it would show up in order because it'd be the most recent one. Yeah. So that's I think that's issue. Jenny. That sounds right. Yep. We just, we just. We just leave this one up broken. For the record. <laughs> yep. Until until the fixed one is ready, then upload the fixed one, then delete the original one. I mean, I'm yeah. an archivist. I, I say never delete the first one, but I leave it to you. Um, well, let's unpublish it. Make it sure. private. Make it, make it, uh, private. Make it unlisted. unlisted. Yeah. Yeah. That can way people can, can still get yeah. to it if they want. Yeah, but and it won't then, show up in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, P.S. I should first of all we should do the titles and then I should make a disclaimer, which was um, uh, what I meant to say about Tell It Anyway is that I'm going to hound everybody on the show to be on that show at some point. Not that they are already booked because that would be presumptuous. Oh, you're booked. I'll totally go. I'll, I'll tell I, you. We've been waiting to ask you, Scott, because a we've been waiting and b nerdtacular. 
that's a lot I understand. of stories. Uh, the, the hard part for me is going to be what story have I not already told? Right, and uh, that's the other thing too. Is like we, we want you to tell a real doozy. To be yeah. honest. Yeah, yeah Tinvex giving me uh, giving me a hard time. He's like the, that you were not the villain of that story, Tom. You sandbagged. Wait, do these stories have to be truthful? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't get all up on people about dates and times because I can't hardly remember the years in which these stories. There's no fact checking staff. If that no. Was do, do you have Do you have a line where you draw about the content? No. Okay. Actually, no. All words. We don't like to be mean to other. Ha, no, won't be mean. Just, yeah, we don't like to be mean to other people who aren't on the show. We like to give them the benefit of the doubt. And so it, it can be any story from our past. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. From yeah. your past. Yes. From someone else. No, 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 Diane. I'm saving all my deep dark stuff for podcast sweeps. Um, <laughs> right. I got some crazy ass I'm stuff. I'm sorry, you I'm need so titles. Uh, I really like beggars can be choosers. I think that's so great. Um, let's see. Choose your own DTNS. <laughs> I always love it. I don't. I know Tom. You don't like it when the show goes away, but I, I actually love the alt, the diverging verses. Like we had a brief Marvel Secret Wars, and now we're back to the original timeline. Um, ba -ba -ba, what else? Um, Gorilla Grass Man. Gorilla Grass Man. Comma Man it has to be a comma there before man. Uh, what hovers the hoverboards? I like the grammar. Not bad. I like the grammar choice. Oh, where we'll go, where we're going, we'll need magnets. <laughs> that, that's really strong. Back to the Future 30th was just a couple days ago, right? Something like Hoverboards, how do they work? Wait a minute, yeah. is that an ICP reference? Um, yes. Yes, it is. It must it be, is. right? It has to be. It has to be that song, Miracles. Yeah. How do they work? Magnets. magnets. How do they work? Ah, I don't know. I, I like ICP. Re <laughs> I like ICP references, so I'll I'll vote on that one. Uh, I like. Uh, uh, where did it go? I lost it because I upvoted it. Oh, smoke gorilla grass every day. <laughs> that was inevitably wonderful. Um, Knew that was coming. Let's see. You mean like? Whoops, that's not it. Smoke weed every day. Like that. <laughs> That's over. So I'm, I'm editing right now. Yeah, so. I know. Uh, let's see. I'm looking for little deep cuts here, but I'm I'm thinking I really like beggars can be choosers. Um. The other thing, if you want to know the other cool thing I just did for Tell It Anyway that I didn't know you can do, which is uh, a one Tom Merritt told me about the Free Music Archive, which I didn't realize was from WFMU, which I grew up listening to. And so I just made a mixtape of all the music we've used on the show, the best of it. A, uh, a mix, an online mixtape that you can listen to. If you liked the music in the show, you can listen to the music now, which I know my husband will be listening to obsessively. <laughs> as soon as he gets the link. I'm of the belief that I think, at least in uh, general vernacular, mixtape should replace playlist. Yes, agree. I made a special mixtape for you. It's so much more resonant uh, of our pasts. Um, so, oh, so beggars can be choosers as the... Uh, the, the uh, I don't know, Tom. Well, Tom's actually doing real editing right now, so um, I guess... Well, let me ask you this then. So what should I edit? Should I just edit the part where Tom disappeared, or do I also do the one where Scott disappeared? Because that's when we came on. Oh, boy. See, you know yeah, see this, is, this is my argument for just leaving it be. <laughs> because <laughs> otherwise you're going to get so many... Um, well, you can stay... As long as all your transitions are okay, you're fine. But if you, you had a bunch of... You know, like when Tom maybe yeah, on. maybe there's a little transition tightening to do. I can do that. I'm just wondering, do you want me to like cut up oh. the part where we we're saying what happened to Tom? Did Tom did go somewhere? You know that. You know, I think that you should use your editor judgment and do it. Okay. I, right. What I just did for audio is I cut from where Scott says the very last line that was written, which is you ought to bring your own mouse and keyboard, to where he picked up and said. And if you stood these uh, next to each other, and it okay, good. 
Because there's also the part where... Well, what about where you disappeared? That is where he disappeared, isn't it? That's where I disappeared from myself, but I know what Roger's asking, because on the video, I didn't disappear there. You kept talking. Oh, yeah. right, right. So, but the pickup line is where we have Scott start to say, to USB, so you just lose the first time he said that. Okay. Yeah. But there's two, there's two instances where you guys disappeared, like... First time it would Oh, you're talking about the second time where you and Jenny yeah. jumped in? We can leave yeah. that one okay. That okay, one okay. that one we kept going. We never actually okay. stopped down. All right. So, so I I'll, I'll edit the first one and not the second one. Right? Is that what you were saying too, Jenny? Yep. Yep. Okay. Got it. Understood. I just got a message from someone saying they've had trouble with Hangout all day. Wonder if we were Yeah, and the you know the Google Doc like re refreshed on me in the middle of the headlines too. So Google Ooh. something's up with Google. Yeah, it must be. I wonder if someone sat on someone's keyboard. <laughs> like Can you imagine if that was what what was the issue? <laughs> It'd be great. They put a coffee cup on the delete button. Oops, sorry. <laughs> what did you do? It? Janice from accounting dropped a donut on my computer. <laughs> so this beggars can be choosers, right? Did I pick yeah. that up correctly? Beggar, I think can was uh capitalized like beggars can be choosers. Got it. Thank you for choosing the title. That was a good title. There are a lot of good titles. There's always a lot of good titles. We have good titlers. Um, also, I spent part of this show designing what I think might be the most amazing t-shirt for Nerdtacular based on the fact that someone custom designed a t-shirt for Nerdtacular. Yeah, well, and I just got inspired. We'll send, send over a doodle or something. Yeah. It's like, a, it's like a word puzzle. Coat's coming off. Oh, boy. You got that coat. Post-show. It's too hot, dude. It's L.A. Come on now. Yeah, it's warm. It got warm since I came down here. It wasn't that bad earlier. Heat it up. It's the summertime. Summer, summer, summertime. All right, so I need to grab the video. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, you can't grab the video yet because we're still streaming yeah. it. So don't try. Who knows what will happen? Everything. Given the fact that I've had probably more Skype problems than I've ever had Hangout problems, mm. I'm still I'm still cool even after today. If I was paying them thousands of dollars, then I might be more upset. Yeah, that's the thing. I really want to see what their new gaming streaming thing is, YouTube Play or whatever it is, YouTube Gaming. It's just going to be the YouTube live stream tool with a little better interface, I think. Is it? Yeah. I'm hoping it's better latency. Yeah, I want it to be better than all those three things you said. <laughs> yeah. I, want I don't it. know. Maybe it is. Uh, I actually don't know anything about it, even with my YouTube bear wife. She's mm -hmm. in the creator space where they want to, like her, the only way she's involved in that at all would be like they want to have a creator come into the YouTube space and do one of the gaming streams from sure. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You she doesn't have, actually work on the product. If so, Swifty or somebody come in for the yeah, afternoon. And totally. But I, I, I just hope that it's a strong play because they're, they're going up against, you know, the, the relative behemoth in the very specific niche of game streaming. It seems like they'd want to do all they could to make it seem silly for us not to move over to YouTube given their, you know, back end and everything. So, Well, their big advantage is archiving, right? Yeah. So they don't have to win at live right away to be successful. They just have to compete. Uh, in my head, I'm inventing a song called I Got Me a YouTube Wife. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no streaming, no cry. <laughs> Here, here's the tune. I got a tune for you. Here. Here you go. Oh! oh. No! <laughs> you just got to put words on it. I remember you used to stand in the line of the bank and you would always hear that. Oh, yeah. So you answer your phone. Back when the Finnish ruled the world. I... I'm finished with you. Mm. All right. Uh, anything else? <laughs> I'm uh, still publishing the show. I'm sorry this because uh, of the... Yeah. Oh, no it's going oh that's slow. right. I still need to drop in my notes. That I, I yeah. I'm, up, I'm uploading, though. I'm, I'm to the uploading stage. So. What happened to the... Uh, oh, there it is. So many tabs. Doing good. The show... For, has so many tabs. I will put the uh, the audio version of what happened on Alpha Geek Radio will actually be in the the treasure chest under the full bit. But I'm also putting the uh, deleted excerpt from 
150624 in her chest as well. So for a, uh, a subscriber at the treasure chest access level, they'll be able to find it in there now. Ooh. I don't know how interesting that is, but it's there. <laughs> Um, what else is going on with everybody these days? Got uh, a sword and laser coming up. Ooh, exciting. Ooh, is that today? It is. Hold on. <laughs> City of Stairs wrap-up episode. City of Stairs. Oh, yeah. Robert Jackson Bennett. I want to check that out. It's good. You guys good seem book. to be positive on it in previous episodes. So yeah. you're done now. And uh, wow, did he set it up. Like he did a, I don't want to spoil Sword and Laser too much, but he did a great job of wrapping up the story so you feel good, like I got I, I got a finish to the story, mm -hmm. but then really setting up the sequels so that you'll want to find out what happens to those characters. That's a real skill to do that. Yeah, it's clever. I, uh, I was, I was I mean, you've probably answered this before, but do you mostly audio read these books or are you, what are you doing? I do, yeah. I'm reading Nemesis Games by James S.A. Corey on Kindle, uh, but the because of 2X as a fallback measure, uh, I, I usually listen to the Sword and Laser pick on Audible or da or uh, a Downpour, if I can. Okay, that makes sense. But uh, I usually don't listen to those on 2X unless I start running behind, and I had to finish City of Stairs on 2X. Thankfully, that narrator uh, was very intelligible. At 2x. It's also good they didn't record it at 2x, so you had to hear it at 4x. Think of that. <laughs> <laughs> right. That would have been a problem. I only listen to the instance on 2x, though. I'm <laughs> good. That's good. Um, I don't know why. We're interviewing Corey Stockton tomorrow. Or oh, on fantastic. Give it I am, and then uh, we have a probably a big show about the patch on Friday, and all kinds of stuff going on. I listen to the Angry Chicken, and uh, we have concerns, and tell it anyway at 2X as well. It's not just Yeah. You. I don't feel so bad, then. I feel That's bad. why I'm always telling Jenny she's got great energy. <laughs> 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 you just talk so fast. It is so that's good. That's right. That's right. No, I feel like any show that's an hour and change is automatically eligible for 2X listening. It's doubled the number of podcasts I can listen to. That's right. Okay. I do believe my time has come. Da -da. Oh, no, I can't even sing that. Jeez. What was that? What were you saying? I, just, I almost just cost us a million dollars. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I sang Summertime earlier, so. Oh, I almost just sang a Beatles song about a road oh. that goes along a long time, and it winds, and then it's the end. Uh <laughs> Can I even describe it without having to pay money? No. Yeesh. That weird-looking lady. Uh, <laughs> not you. I don't know where I was going with that. I was going to compare Paul McCartney to a weird-looking lady. <laughs> weird-looking old grandma, Paul McCartney. You know, let a weird old grandma come after you. Is what I mean. <laughs> All right, I'm out of the post, but stay tuned for Sword and Laser and my so-called 8-Bit Life immediately following the brand-new quiz show Stump Roger. Hint, you can't.